This video tutorial is all about controlling heart rate. Specifically, it looks at the effects of hormones and nervous mechanisms on heart rate. Now, hopefully, a lot of what I speak about in this video tutorial will be revision for you. So the heart, as I'm sure you all know, pumps blood around the circulatory system. Now, this circulation has several really important roles. The first being transport of oxygen and nutrients. So nutrients such as glucose, fatty acids and amino acids to the tissues. Secondly, the removal of waste products. So that's going to be um, like carbon dioxide from tissues to prevent um, that accumulating, which would otherwise be toxic. Third, the transport of urea. So from the liver to the kidneys. And finally, to distribute heat away from the body or deliver it to the skin to radiate away. Now, the requirement of the cells and tissues is going to vary according to their level of activity. When you are being physically active, your muscle cells are going to need more oxygen and glucose so that they can respire more. Your heart muscle cells will also need more oxygen and fatty acids. So all the muscles will also need um, to remove carbon dioxide and heat. It's essential that the, um, that the circulatory system can adapt to meet the needs of the tissues. And part of this adaptation is controlling the activity of the heart. So in terms of controlling the activity, the heart action can be modified um, in a few different ways. Firstly, you can either raise or lower the heart rate. So that's the number of beats per minute. Secondly, you could alter the force of the contractions. So that's the contractions of the ventricle walls. Or thirdly, you could alter the stroke volume, so the volume of blood being pumped in every single beat. Now we're going to have um, just a little moment to revise essentially the heart rate and how it's controlled, the, the beats controlled. So the rate of the heartbeats is affected by a number of factors. Um, firstly, you should remember the term myogenic, so the cardiac muscle um, in the heart is myogenic. This just means it can initiate its own beat at regular intervals, which is utterly extraordinary in my opinion. Um, but the atrial walls, the atrial muscles, have a higher myogenic rate than the ventricular walls. So the two pairs of chambers need to somehow be coordinated. They need to contract in a coordinated fashion or the heart action will be entirely ineffective. So the coordinated um, sort of mechanism is absolutely essential. Now, the way that this happens is via the heart's own pacemaker. The sinoatrial node um, can be considered the pacemaker. So the SAN initiates waves of excitation that override the myogenic action of the cardiac muscle. So the SAN is a region of tissue that can initiate an action potential. Now that action potential um, is gonna travel as a wave of excitation over the atrial walls through the AVN, that's the atrioventricular node, down the perkine fibers. To, um, so down the perkine fibers to the walls of the ventricles and then it's gonna cause the walls of the ventricles to contract. And that's just shown again here. So we've got the SAN and the wave of excitation spreading across the atria to the AVN and then down the perkine fibers um, and then the wave of excitation and spreading up over the ventricle walls. Now the heart muscle is also able to respond directly to the hormone adrenaline and that would increase um, the rate of heart contractions. At rest then, the heart rate is controlled by the ASN, the SAN, um, and this is gonna have a set frequency which will vary from person to person. So the frequency of excitation is typically about 60 to 80 beats per minute. And you can see that on echocardiograms like the one that's shown on the slide in front of you. But the frequency of um, these excitatory waves can be altered um, by the output from the cardiovascular center in the me medulla oblongata. So um, the medulla oblongata is based um, sort of at the bottom of the brain stem as shown on the slide um, there in front of you. So nerves from the cardiovascular center 
in the medulla oblongata of the brainstem um, supply the SAN in the heart. Now, these nerves are part of the autonomic nervous system, and they don't initiate a contraction, but can affect the frequency of contractions. Now, there's sort of two ways that this can happen. So action potentials sent down a sympathetic nerve can cause the release of the neurotransmitter noradrenaline. Now, when noradrenaline is released, that's going to increase the heart rate. In comparison, action potentials sent down the vagus nerve can release the neurotransmitter um, acetylcholine, which is going to be responsible for reducing heart rate. So two different hormones there having two different effects. Now, there are a range of environmental factors that can affect heart rate. So input from different sensory receptors is fed to the cardiovascular center in the medulla oblongata. And some input, uh, inputs are going to increase heart rate and others will decrease it. And it's the interaction of all these different inputs, which is coordinated by the cardiovascular center, to ensure that the output to the SAN is appropriate to the sort of overall conditions. Now, sensory inputs to the cardiovascular center um, are sort of shown um, on the slide in front of you. So the first that we'll look at is the stretch receptors. So stretch receptors in muscles detected um, from sort of movement in the limbs can send impulses to the cardiovascular center informing the cardiovascular center that extra oxygen um, is needed. And then that would um, end up resulting in an increase in heart rate. We also have um, chemoreceptors. So chemoreceptors in the carotid arteries, um, as well as in the aorta and the brain, are responsible for monitoring the pH of the blood. When we exercise, the muscles produce more carbon dioxide. Now, some of this reacts with the water, which will affect the transport of oxygen. The change in the pH is detected by the chemoreceptors, which will send action potentials to the cardiovascular center. And this will then um, cause an increase in heart rate. Now, we can also monitor the concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood. So when we stop exercising, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood will obviously fall, and this will reduce the activity of the accelerator pathways and result in a decline in heart rate. Finally, um, we have stretch receptors in the walls of the carotid sinus, which monitor blood pressure. Now the carotid sinus is just a small swelling in the carotid artery. Um, and an increase in blood pressure, perhaps during vigorous exercise, can be detected by these stretch receptors. Now, if the pressure rises too high, the stretch receptors will send action potentials to the um, radio, sorry, cardiovascular center, um, which will then lead to a reduction in heart rate. Now, if the mechanism controlling the heart um, and the heart rate fails, then we can put in an artificial help, um, sort of an artificial pacemaker, um, and that can just be fitted a little bit like shown in um, the image on the slide in front of you. So this um, artificial pacemaker can deliver an electrical impulse to the heart muscle. So the pacemaker is implanted just under the skin and fat on the chest, and um, will then be connected to the SAN, or it can actually be connected directly to the ventricle walls.